Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Complete Dentures 2 course for New York City College of Technology. This week we're going to be covering denture recovery, finishing, and polishing. Up until this point, we recovered all the main steps. More recently, we talked about deflasking of your process complete dentures, and then selective grinding and creating a bilateral balanced occlusion. Now we've reached the point where we have our dentures still looted to our casts. Uh, we will need to recover those dentures safely to begin the finishing and polishing procedures. So let's begin. So the Air Force uh, speaks about the different types of materials and equipment that need to be used. Uh, in a lot of laboratories, there will be times where you find yourself without these pieces of equipment, which can cause this stage to have a little difficulty. Uh, as the Air Force says, most dentures are undercut in varying amounts. So breakage and distortion of the denture is inevitable if an attempt is made to pry off the processed dentures from the cast. Undercuts on the upper are more commonly found beneath the labial flanges, while on the mandibular denture, they're more commonly on the lingual flanges like you see in this video here. It's important that in the absence of a pneumatic chisel, that you pry from multiple different angles. If you try to pry a denture off a cast from one angle, it will grab undercuts and you will have a high probability of fracturing the denture base. Now, if a denture has significant undercuts, as you see in this video here, majority of the stone will be stuck inside of the intaglio surface. Some of it will be removed with a knife easily. Other portions without a pneumatic chisel can prove to be very difficult. But we'll talk about this more in an instructional video that goes along with this week's session in your laboratory section. The Air Force tells you that the equipment and materials needed in order to perform this recovery of the denture is a plaster saw, a pneumatic chisel, a shell blaster, and sodium citrate. We'll talk about the plaster saw in a moment. Shell blaster is nothing more than a larger scale sand blaster and uh, it substitutes the aluminum oxide with walnut shells. Uh, the granules are larger and they are a little more safer to use on an acrylic surface. When using a sand blaster with high PSI, if you leave the sand blaster blasting directly close to the acrylic surface, you can actually wear away the surface. So proceed with caution. If you do not have a shell blaster and are going to be using a sand blaster, make sure the PSIs are lower than you would use for sandblasting metal or porcelain. Next is a pneumatic chisel. Uh, pretty basic, it works like a handheld jackhammer. Different heads you can see here for different purposes, but this tool is great to use when uh, deflasking and recovery of the denture. Uh, the other thing that the Air Force speaks about is using sodium citrate, which is nothing more than a plaster or stone remover made by multiple different various companies. Uh, all four of these things in combination uh, should give you good results. So now we can get into our recovery procedures themselves. So recovering a denture from its processing cast requires considerable amounts of care, especially when using the plaster saw. So you're going to make initial cuts with a plaster saw and remove the segments by gently wedging a knife in between those cuts. Figure 1 shows the sequence to follow when removing the different segments of the maxillary cast and mandibular cast. So when you see, I find it helpful to always kind of trace out these cuts and also paying very, very, very close attention to the depth of the cut. But this illustration shows the sections that you can create these segments in order to safely remove the denture from the cast without fracturing the denture base. So the Air Force tells you that when using the plaster saw, it's very easy to cut into the base without being aware of it, since the model is upside down. Uh, one way to improve visibility is to saw the cast under a stream of water and flush the debris away as you cut. Uh, it can also be very easy for you to cut the palatal section of a maxillary denture. Uh, if the patient has a deep palatal vault, you can be cutting into the denture base and be so far away from the borders of the denture but actually be cutting into the depth of the paddle vault. So be very careful when performing these cuts. Uh, after removing the bulk of the base of the cast, you can use the pneumatic chisel to remove all of the stones stuck within the undercuts. The pneumatic chisel is probably one of the best tools to use for this. 
Uh, without it, it could cause a lot of issues with using a Murphy knife and a mallet trying to chisel away the stone by hand. Uh, and that increases the probability of fracturing or damaging your denture. Once the major parts of the stone have been removed from the undercuts, you can then make use of a shell blaster, as we spoke about before. Uh, it uses wall, uh, the walnut shells, but it's not really intended for removing large amounts of stone, which is why the pneumatic chisel is used first. So to prevent warping or burning of the denture resin, you don't want to hold it closer than four inches away from the blaster nozzle. As an added precaution, uh, keep a piece of the work moving constantly as you're uh, sandblasting or shell blasting this denture. Now in the video, this is the use of a sandblaster. Once again, this is aluminum oxide. With high PSIs, if you leave the blaster too close to an area without moving it around, you could risk damage of the denture base. So uh, same concept, low PSIs, keep the denture moving, keep the nozzle moving if you can, uh, both when using a shell nut blaster or a sand blaster, but the Air Force does suggest using a shell blaster with the walnut shell particles. Uh, after all this is said and done, there might still be very, very minute reminences, maybe interproximally in between teeth or things like that. Uh, you can soak the denture in the sodium citrate, the stone remover solution, uh, to remove any last traces of stone within the denture. So now that we have recovered the complete denture safely from the models, it's now time to start removing the flash and sharp edges. Uh, when doing this, it's important to remove the flash first. Some of it can be so sharp it could actually cut skin. Uh, so we want to make sure that the dentures are safe to handle, so removing flash should be the first step, and then removing sharp edges and rounding borders. But as we get into finishing, finishing is a process of contouring the denture base to the desired shape and thickness. Uh, only a little bit of finishing is required if the final wax up was done properly and packing and processing was also done correctly. So in finishing, uh, we need to know that we are using abrasive materials to finish the complete dentures. But you never want to apply any of these abrasives, uh, not only burrs and cutting tools, but also the pumice, which is like a wet sand that acts like a sandpaper, uh, to any tissue-bearing surfaces, right? The intaglio surface uh, should basically be untouched by any of these abrasives. Uh, the best analogy that I can give for people who may be more involved with fixed work is that you know when you create a coping for a die if you were to carve the inside of that coping would it still fit snugly on the die the answer is no the same concept is that we rely on the way the denture and the tissue bearing surfaces and the intaglio interact with one another so if we lose height of a denture border or if we lose the definition of the intaglio surface, we are compromising the fit of that denture. Which brings me to the next topic of altering the height and the width of the peripheral roll of the denture, right? the border. We don't want to eliminate height because, once again, it has to do with the way this denture fits properly. Eliminating the height can cause retention issues. Another issue is the width of the peripheral roll. Right? If a border ends up being too thin because it was grinded too much, uh, we can really affect lip support. Right? So we can end up having a patient looking like they have a deficient lip if we remove too much of this border. So it's important that we take caution. Some technicians draw with a pencil to trace out those areas. Uh, so it's important to take care uh, and we have to compensate for future polishing steps as well. Uh, the concept is we're using abrasives, right? And we have learned before in previous lectures that polishing is nothing than the reduction of larger scratches into smaller scratches. And how that done is by removing surface material. So as we apply these different steps in finishing and polishing, we are actually removing surface. So if we remove too much surface in the beginning and forget that we are still having to do the procedures of pumicing and polishing, the end result of the denture could be much thinner than what we initially had uh, desired. So we want to be sure that we're compensating for all the polishing steps and all the removal of surfaces throughout all of these polishing procedures. 
as you can see, it's very important how we use our burr and how we cut the borders. Initially removing flash, we're cutting up until the visible border, right? We can see the peripheral roll as it was packed onto the work and cast. So we can kind of follow those anatomical landmarks as we reduce and round borders and peripheral rolls. But in the next slide, we're going to talk more in depth about how to really approach uh, trimming a border and making sure that it's rounded while also being sure that we do not reduce the height or thin the border too much. So what we see here is a diagram to help us understand about how to use a carbide burr in the removal of flash and rounding peripheral rolls and borders. What we see is that if we use a carbide burr, which is common within the, uh, within the field, we're looking at what happens when the burr is used in a single direction. Now, uh, new technicians and students, are, it's very common for them to approach the burr in a single direction, usually vertically, to kind of reduce the sharpness of the border. But what can result is what you see in the middle image here. This illustration shows that by only approaching it from one single vertical direction, we are actually creating two sharp edges on either side. The goal here is to use multi-directional use of the carbide burr up and over and around the border, that motion will cause a, a nice rounded peripheral roll while not reducing too much height of the border. Now with that said, uh, this needs to be done with care. You can also still reduce the border if you're applying too much pressure. So the middle image is something that we don't want to create. If we're worried about whether is my border too sharp or is it you know, too thick. Uh, average thickness of borders, unless you're compensating for lip support, is around three millimeters. Uh, if you're worried about sharpness, my advice is to always run your finger around the border. If it's sharp to your finger, the tissues in the mouth are hypersensitive compared to uh, the, the skin on your fingers. Uh, some people say that oral pain is probably the worst type of pain. So if it is sharp to your finger, you can pretty much bet that the patient will find severe discomfort uh, if, they, if you can feel sharpness on the denture border with your finger. So now we move on to some more finishing steps uh, in the removal of nodules and defining digital margins. So what you're going to do is you're going to cut or carefully grind away resin bubbles from all the surfaces, even facially. And you want to check the interior, the intaglio of the denture uh, with a finger to once again locate any nodules of acrylic that can occur. Uh, no matter how well you pour a model, there's usually very small, small uh, bubbles or voids that can get filled with acrylic, and some of them are even hard to see with the naked eye. Uh, sometimes this will appear on the intaglio surface as sharp little nodules that can be just flaked off with uh, either your nail or maybe even a surgical blade, but it's quite easy to do. The other thing is it's very important aesthetically and for hygiene to finish gingival margins properly. What we see in figure 3A is an image of a denture that was created uh, years ago where the technician never actually finished and created a distinct gingival margin, uh, basically finish line between the pink acrylic and the tooth acrylic. Uh, and what can occur here is that over time, maybe in the beginning, this denture seemed like it was fully polished and, and, and glossy. But what can occur is that uh, saliva and bacteria kind of get in between that unfinished seam of the acrylic and the denture tooth and can cause what you see here. So first of all is that one, obviously this isn't very aesthetic, and number two, it can be somewhat of a hygiene nightmare. Uh, B is a new denture created, uh, a basic denture, but the gingival margins and the contour of the gingival mar margins and the finishing is done properly. So this denture will not trap as much bacteria or food in those gingival margin areas and this is what you look for when you're going to be finishing your denture cases. Which now brings us to the portion where we're going to contour our denture base. So in this specific step we're going to be smoothing the eminence contours and the base of the denture teeth with the appropriate grade of finishing materials. In this case, we're using a fine carbide burr. Uh, if necessary, you can continue shaping and smoothing the denture surfaces, uh, like the facial and lingual borders. But remember that the time that you're spending in the acrylic resin for polishing now means that the anatomical detail placed on the denture base 
is going to be less uh, likely to be pumiced away. It's also important to remember that a lot of these contours should have been done in wax. So the entire finishing process should not take more than maybe 10 to 15 minutes, possibly less. Now there are denture technicians out there who prefer to carve all their anatomy post-processing, which means that the carving of the denture would have to include all of the root eminences and basic contours that you performed, usually when you wax and festooned the case. Either way, there is no right or wrong method. Uh, just be sure that no matter how you contour your denture, whether in wax or acrylic, that all surfaces are smooth, that your borders have proper height and thickness, and it's also pertinent to remember that you do not forget to check your freedoms. Uh, freedoms need to be freed. Even if they were freed in wax, it does not necessarily mean that translated during processing. So make your way back to your freedoms, free them if necessary. Uh, these freedoms are important to function. A uh, simple smile and a denture that has not had the freedoms freed can cause the denture to dislodge. Uh, another very particular freedom is your lingual freedom uh, underneath your tongue. Uh, if that freedom is impinged during the motion of the tongue and function, the lower denture can pop out. So please be sure that your freedoms are all freed and ready for polishing. So polishing is the procedure where we're going to remove all the scratches from the denture base and produce a generally glossy finish. After polishing, the denture tends to be uh, easier to clean, it accumulates less food, and becomes more stain resistant. Polished surfaces feel better to the patient's tongue and are less likely to irritate other surrounding soft tissues. What's important here is that even the Air Force states that a reflective mirror-like surface is not desired in this step. I feel that a lot of things that are out there in the industry show completely smooth, glossy, mirror-like surfaces on dentures. Uh, in reality, those kind of surfaces actually can in turn trap more. Uh, things are more likely to stick to a shiny, smooth surface than a well-textured, polished surface. And at the end of the day, if we are restoring the gingival anatomy, and making an oral prosthetic to represent nature, then our tissue is not smooth and glossy. Therefore, our tissue needs texture and our denture bases need texture. So uh, with that said, we are looking for something that is as lifelike in appearance and function as possible. So to begin, what materials and equipment do we need for this polishing stage, right? Our dentures are finished, they're contoured properly, and now we're going to get into our polishing. So what do we need? Uh, figure 1, A and B, show the different types of abrasives that are common. Uh, A1 shows the basic pumice. Comes in sand form and water is added. It almost creates like a muddy texture and it acts as a wet abrasive, like a sandpaper. And B is a polishing compound. We'll talk about Tripoli and high shine compounds. Uh, they get applied to a wheel and then in turn applied to the denture. Figure 2 shows different types of bristle brushes, which are very common in polishing procedures. Uh, 2A shows a typical B20 uh, black bristle brush, and 2B shows uh, what's commonly referred to as Robinson brushes. Uh, that's a company that is synonymous with these type of brushes. Uh, but they're basically just small mounted bristle brushes that we also use to apply some pumice. And 3A and 3B are some of the most common tools needed to polish. Uh, these are going to be used, the rag wheel and felt cone tips, uh, for the application of pumice and the high shine procedures. So if we talk about what the polishing is, you know, it's going to take use of a series of progressively finer abrasive agents to produce a denture-based gloss, right? And as we spoke about before, the mirror-like appearance is not desirable. Uh, each of the wheels and brushes used to apply these agents are assigned to those specific agents. And what I mean by that is that you should not mix your brushes or your rag wheels, right? If you're going to have a rag wheel for pumice, it's going to get wet and it's going to contain that sandy texture. Uh, when you apply the compound for high shine procedures, you need it to be dry and clean, right? If you have a wet rag wheel that has maybe dried up pieces of pumice and uh, you apply it to a denture that's ready for high shine, 
then what ends up happening is you can technically scratch the surface again. So always keep those agents separate with their own wheels and bristle brushes. And obviously you want to use adequate equipment, PPE. You want to use goggles to prevent aerosols and, and pumice and polishing compound from getting in your eyes. And obviously a mask to protect yourself from breathing in any of those harmful substances. Next, we move into actually polishing and doing the procedures itself. So the Air Force talks about placing protective tape over the teeth so that you do not uh, abrade them with these abrasives. Uh, truth of the matter is, is that if you take care when pumicing, this step is not 100% nece not necessary. A lot of the times technicians prefer to actually get a little pumice on their teeth so that they can get a nice gloss when they high shine the denture. Now, if for whatever reason you want to protect your teeth, uh, then you can do so with this protective tape. Uh, so to begin the polishing steps, uh, you're going to apply the wet pumice with a coarse black brush wheel, as you see in figure two. Uh, you're going to carefully smooth the interproximal areas and the gingival trim areas and uh, control the location of the brush wheel and be sure to keep it moving, right? Because if the wheel is allowed to remain in one place for too long, you can actually burn the acrylic. And that also goes for the speed of the wheel, not only location. If you have this wheel on high, it's important that you continuously add wet pumice to the denture base. If you don't, you can burn the denture and it'll be difficult to kind of get those contours back if you need to grind away any acrylic that's been burned by the bristle brush. So once satisfied with the smoothness and gingival trimming, uh, you're going to move on to the palatal section of the maxillary denture. The Bristle brush wheel you see is in the shape of a cone. It's the same type of bristles, it's just shaped differently to aid in reaching the hard to reach areas like the palate. But after the completion of pumicing the palate and the surfaces, you can move it to the buccal surface of the maxillary, uh, the lingual flanges of the mandibular, and things like that. Uh, a lot of pumicing should not be necessary if care was taken in the wax up stage and the finishing stage. Uh, if you notice that there's just so many burr cuts on your denture from your finishing stage and the pumice does not seem to be doing anything, it might be advantageous for you to take that denture back and to kind of finish those contours maybe with a rubber wheel or a finer carbide burr. So here we have a short video on using different types of tools in order to achieve the result we're looking for during our pumicing stage. All right. So you finish the bulk polishing of the denture base with a rag wheel. Uh, you're going to see that in a little bit. But we also talk about the use of Robison brushes to uh, remove any scratches or dulled out areas from shell blasting on the denture teeth. Uh, we also spoke about you know, selective grinding and grinding on the teeth and then smoothing those areas out. You just want to be cautious when using the bristle brush and pumice that you do not remove occlusal contacts that you work so hard to get during the selective grinding process. All right. So that's really what those Robinson brushes are best for, including hard to reach areas like interproximal areas and gingival margins. The felt tip or cone that you see here is great for palatal vault areas. Uh, gets into the deep areas that a wheel cannot reach. And it's also great for tongue areas that are difficult to get to uh, with a regular rag wheel as well. But the rag wheel is the primary tool used for pumicing. It will give you the smoothest flat surfaces. Now once again, you should probably not be pumicing on high. Pumicing on high, you run a high risk of flattening and smoothing anatomically correct structures. Uh, the only areas that should be really rounded and smooth and mirror-like are denture borders and possibly the lingual portion of your mandibular denture since the tongue sits in that space. Uh, besides that, all aesthetic areas should have the proper tissue texture to it. The next step that the Air Force talks about uh, that's not done often uh, to my knowledge within the denture community is the application of Tripoli. Uh, it is an extra step, however, uh, it was taught to me as a student and therefore I like to talk about it since it is in the text. Uh, so the polish the denture with Tripoli, 
you should use a set of different wheels and brushes. And at this stage, you would inspect the denture for scratches and irregularities not visible during the pumice stage and repeat earlier steps of pumicing and polishing with Tripoli until the desired smoothness is attained. Once you rinse off the pumice, you can kind of take a look and see, are there burr cuts? Do I need to do this again? Do I need to go back to the bench and smooth out these areas during contouring? Uh, regardless, every step needs to be done again. So if you do need to go back to the bench and smooth out areas, you will need to do pumice once again and move on to Tripoli after. You cannot stip, skip steps. So to complete the final polishing of the denture base, you should be using a soft, dry rag wheel, as you see in the video below. Uh, it's going to be impregnated with a commercial a polishing compound, and it's formulated for acrylic resins. Once the compound is applied to the wheel, it is then vigorously applied to the denture. Once you're done, you can steam off any residual compound and even put it in a bag with some green soap or ammonia and water uh, and put it into an ultrasonic cleaning unit for about 10 minutes. Now, it's very difficult to evaluate the proper polish of a denture when a denture is still wet. Anything that is wet will give you the illusion that it is fully polished and reflective. Allow the denture to dry. Dry it with a towel or rag, and then evaluate to see if there are any unreflective surfaces or rough surfaces. If this is the case, you more than likely will have to at least repeat the procedures of pumicing, tripoli, and polishing all over again. But once you have achieved your desired results, uh, when it comes time to shipping the denture and completing the case for the dentist, uh, to prevent the acrylic resin from drying or subsequently undergoing dimensional changes, you want to place those dentures into a moist denture bag prior to delivery. Uh, if you are going to ship them uh, to far distances, you want to make sure that the denture stays moist, and you can even add an antimicrobial agent to prevent the growth of bacteria and mold. And what are the results? The results are what you see here. Video on top shows the results of the denture being polished throughout this presentation. Highly detailed, textured, and polished surfaces. I want to make note the difference between something that is rough and something that is textured and finished. Something that is rough is not polished, not finished, which means that it can attract food. It was not grinded properly. It was not pumiced properly. Something textured has received pumice, possibly Tripoli, and high shine which means that all the surfaces are fully polished and finished. However, it maintains the texture of natural anatomy. What you see on the bottom is on the left, we have a denture that is processed and finished and characterized, fully polished, and then that same denture inserted intraorally. And we can see how well the arches blend in with the natural gingival anatomy and color. And this is the goal that we strive for when creating our complete dentures and polishing and finishing them. Our readings for this week are page 330 to 334 in the Air Force Manual. Uh, I hope this was helpful to you. Remember that there are two other instructional videos uh, created by me for this week's content, along with some other videos and links that are supplemental. Uh, hope you enjoyed it, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Have a great day, guys.